you have seen it from every level. You've worked in private sector. You've worked in United Nations level. You've, you've riven above, above country level. Catherine, what are you seeing now? We're talking about this worry a lot, but are we actually putting it into action? Are we changing things? Well, what I'm seeing now are all the indicators that those of us who worked in response to the 2008 food crisis all turning green. They're all happening. So the perfect storm is right across, uh, is, is coming towards us very quickly, but we can avoid it. Mm -hmm. the, ch the challenge is, will we act differently? Will we take different pathways? And that means taking preemptive actions with particularly smallholder farmers, mm -hmm. providing them with the seeds and tools and the capacity to transform their agricultural production using more precision agriculture, increasing their, their harvest during a time of emergency. Mm. Not making it that's a development solution, it's an emergency humanitarian response that will give us the ability for those farmers to produce more at a time when the availability and affordability of food is affecting so many communities. We often forget that there are 500 million smallholder farmers who feed 80% of the people in the countries where they live and work. Imagine if we could provide them with the support that was necessary yeah. to ensure that there was access to affordable, nutritious food. That's what we can do differently. So it's like access to learning, to technology, to money. But where is the money coming from? Is it coming from private? Is it about getting a return on that money? Is it coming from public? Is it is a public-private partnership, in fact? All of the above and then some. <laughs> the reality is we need, we need innovative capital. We yep. need capital, we need private sector capital that's willing to take a risk, but de-risking the capital stack by having the governments and f foundations provide the concessionary capital that is necessary to attract the private sector capital into markets and into agriculture, which has been a field that they've been averse to providing real capital investment in in the past. We can, by, by making the capital stack more blended capital, mm. we can provide those, the, the, the financing to those companies that can begin to support the access to digital tools, biological tools, the kinds of irrigation systems, precision irrigation systems that will allow smallholder farmers to operate differently. But Ambassador Cousin, I'm, you're raising an impact fund. You're going out there probably courting private sector money, which is looking for a home that does good. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. The, 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 maybe the upside, the silver lining of what was the dark cloud of COVID, the health crisis, was a social reckoning that we suddenly realized we needed to put money and action into, into helping others. The issue is, is when we're faced with inflation, when we're faced with a global economy that could be slowing, are governments willing to put their side of the money up? You'll find that governments are willing to put up capital where they can see that capital will have an impact. Mm -hmm. What the challenges that we're having is, is, is realistic. They're, governments are forced to meet that emergency humanitarian need. You, you spoke about what David Beasley was saying, the number of people who are acutely hungry. Mm -hmm. But what governments also recognize is that failure to make these investments will result in increased need in the future. So this is an investment in, in not just resilience, but in ensuring that we don't increase the number of people who are acutely hungry. We know that it costs seven times more to support an emergency response than it does the type of investments that we're discussing here today. So these are smart taxpayer dollar investments. Part of the issue, of course, the real need is that what we call, well, Ukraine, Russia, so the grain bowl of, of the world mm. in many ways is having its own severe like political disruption and therefore food disruption. Where else is hurting right now? Are you feeling the effects here in Latin America? Where in the parts of the world are we most worried about? Well, even before the Ukraine war, there were challenges of food insecurity and those challenges were being primarily driven by conflict and climate and economic instability. That hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. In conflict areas where food insecurity is increasing significantly because of the increased cost of humanitarian assistance. 
we are also witnessing, the, this is an, uh, an El Ni a, a La Nina year, and we know that climate is affecting the, the in India today, yes. the, wheat. The, the wheat in, in India, uh, in, we're seeing it die on the vine because of increased temperatures. As a result, India has in instituted an export ban. Yeah. We're beginning to see more countries institute export bans. When that happens, when net exporting countries impact, uh, <laughs> institute export bans, that has a direct relationship on net importing countries. And the challenge is many of those net importing countries, when the prices are higher, they no longer have the capital to subsidize food because they were already in financial debt trouble mm -hmm. as a result of the investments that they made in COVID. Yeah. So that's why I said there's a perfect storm out there yeah. that we have an opportunity to avoid.